bom dia. Ah, eu estou muito feliz por estar aqui hoje. Ah, muito feliz, muitas pessoas, muitas gente. É meu minha primeira vez esta Florianópolis. Linda. E aí? Eu acho que eu sei o que você está pensando. Gringo vai falar em português? Infelizmente, não. Porque, para dizer a verdade, meu português é uma merda. So if you want anything of value from me, I'm going to have to switch to English. Maybe one day. I'm super excited that you invited me here to talk about drones and film your beautiful island. So here we are on Ilha do Campeche. Beautiful, eh? And now we're going to go through 30 minutes of this, and I'm going to talk through all the details of how I <laughs> built it, right? What, this isn't a drone convention? <laughs> DevOps. Oh, oh, okay. I can do that, too. I can do that, oh, too. Sorry. All right, let's talk a little bit about the mythical five nines. Clickers working. Just a little bit about me. Worked in a lot of different companies of different sizes over the years. Most importantly, though, for this talk is I've had a lot of different roles. And we'll see as you go through these different kind of roles how you look at the same problem from different perspectives. And that's much of how DevOps came about but I'm going to throw a few twists at you, too. i got to point this way so that it works. OK, so just, just a little bit of history of my own personal DevOps timeline. First one I attended was in 2013, and I just went as an attendee. This one was in Austin, Texas, and it blew my mind. I thought I knew what DevOps was, but I had no clue. I was sitting in these meetings, and constantly Googling things. What are they talking about? It was worse than Portuguese. I did not know what they were saying. Uh, but I really dove in and started learning, went to reInvent the same year or the next year. And then DevOps days in Silicon Valley, and I started to understand maybe half of what they were saying. And then I founded Autoscaler in 2016 because I saw a need in the market to do cost optimization for cloud apps. And I spent the next year, year and a half, working with a lot of different DevOps teams and seeing how they work together and really coming to see how, how the glue kind of came together. And then I was excited because this year I get to speak at DevOps. This is my third DevOps Day event, one in Dallas, one in Rio, and now here. So what's this talk about? It's about availability. We're going to go through a little bit of a history. And we're going to do a little bit of uh, myth versus fact, which I always find is fun. Hopefully, break a few myths. What's going on here? There we go. But more than anything, I hope to give you a new perspective. All right, so let's talk just a minute about application quality. I think we would have to agree that higher availability is better, right? Fewer errors is better. Fewer, slower responses is better. So if we take that to its logical extreme, a perfect quality system would be 100% available, zero errors, and zero performance problems, right? That's like our nerd nirvana, right? We got there. Well, the first twist I'm going to throw at you, though, is a quote from Winston Churchill. Perfection is the enemy of progress. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, first off, what are we talking about as far as perfection and progress of an application? So let's redefine that in terms of success. How would you define an application to have success? What about operational costs? What about user satisfaction? We don't think of these, but if we have a perfect application that's up and running all the time, but the users aren't happy? Is that a 
perfect application? No. What about the feature set? The velocity? What if we're missing features that the user community wants? And market share, revenue, all these business kinds of things. So they, they factor in to this equation. So I'm sure everybody in this room is familiar with the analogy of, of where this came from, the, the wall, right? The development operations, we throw stuff over the wall, we heard about it in the previous talk, makes this guy upset because you're working from different, different uh, positions, different goals, and in fact, that's where the term came from, right? DevOps, it's a blending of those two roles. But I'm here to tell you there's more than one wall in an organization, there's lots of silos, and there's the business side of things. Getting a little feedback, is that better? So there's also a wall here where they're throwing over requirements, uh, they're asking for different kinds of operational things, so, in fact, there's even a term that's coming out now called biz DevOps, where some people are proposing putting somebody from the business in on the team to keep those things in sync. What I find interesting is much of the stuff we were just talking about and much of the time where we focus is on this side of the wall. We're talking about costs, right? And that makes a difference. So, we'll come back to that. But let's talk about it specifically about the five nines of availability. What does that translate to? 26 seconds of downtime a month. Not very much, it's only five minutes a year. This is very difficult to pull off. So where did this come from? Started in the 1990s in the telecom industry and it was for the hardware components. Uh, if all the hardware components didn't have a high reliability, then they're constantly replacing them. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to climb up there and replace an antenna every few months. I'm not that bold. But something happened in the late 90s where this myth was born is it jumped from the hardware to the entire system. And I'm not sure exactly how or when I couldn't find in the research, but I believe it was driven by competitive sales pressure. It just sounded cool. Oh, our network is five nines. And there was failures if you didn't meet the five nines, but they typically were fairly small and relative to the size of the contract, they said, ah, we, we know we won't make it, but let's go ahead and promise it and put it into the contract, over committing on it, basically. As an example of that, sometimes they would, they would cover themselves in the fine print. This is a true story. Uh, one network provider advertised five nines of availability, but refunds were only paid if there was an hour of outage a month. If you do the math, that's accidentally 99.85, uh, you know, high availability. Okay, so five nines is really driven by fear. Uh, it's a fear of downtime. Usually it's specified by a non-technical person, high up in the organization or some requirements guy, and like, who doesn't want our system to stay up? How often do you want your system to be down? Well, never. So a lot of times they'll just throw the five nines out there to show like they're tech and educated, and they just throw it there. Hey, we need five nines. It's a safe default. How can I go wrong for that? But they typically do not understand this cost availability curve, and they don't realize that the, the cost of trying to meet this can drive up a system's operational cost dramatically. Uh, it's another case of the requirements wall. Ah, keep it up all the time, or nearly all the time. Okay, so how well do mobile service providers do? The, you know, the telecom industry is the one that came up with this. How well do they do? Not even close. Mobile service providers, these are the top markets in the U.S., Average is about 98.8% reliability on your cell phone calls. We all know this, they drop every now and then, right? Okay, but what about the ISPs, the hard line, your network providers? They should be able to do better, right? They do a little bit better, but not that great. About three nines, 99.9% .9 of the time is the average reliability across different types of uh, ISP providers. Google says it ranges between 0.01 and 1% page failure rates, which is somewhere between 
two and four nines. So this brings up an interesting idea, or uh, if, you, if your consumers of your application are across the public internet, are they even going to notice if you deliver higher reliability than their own ISP? Probably not. So here's an idea. Error handling, we all need to do it. Eventually our systems have an error. Please, please do not do this. I still see this from time to time. My favorite thing to do is to LinkedIn to the CTO and say, oh, you have a null pointer error on file 654. I might want to get to that. Some interesting conversations have started that way. Okay, this is better. Uh, I don't know how, uh, how popular Amazon is here, but Americans, are, we, we have withdrawal symptoms if we can't get something off of Amazon. And on their uh, prime day this year, they were a little under-provisioned or something went wrong. And so they were throwing a few error pages, but they put the dogs, their own dogs of the employees up. So everybody's, you're distracted. You're like, oh, I, did, I didn't get to buy my product, but it's a cute dog. <laughs> Think about this, though. What if you didn't give any response at all? Just go quiet. They might blame it on their ISP. You know, now, don't do this too much, right? They're going to go over to Google and say, wait, Google's working. You're lying to me. But maybe once or twice you could get away with it. All right, so what about the cloud providers? These are the guys, the high end, right? They're running data centers all over the world. Uh, how do they do? Well, in general, they're at about three nines, three and a half nines. The highest one on this list is actually AWS at four nines, but that's only if you're in multi-availability uh, zones to get that. Any single availability zone, you're back at the same 99.95, .95, which is what most Azure and Google is at. So hopefully we've kind of dispelled this five nines. This is a bit of a myth. There are a lot of five nine systems out there. I'm having a little fun with this. Uh, there's stuff in banking and healthcare and uh, avionics, uh, you know, where the system needs to be up that much. But my condition is those systems are not being delivered across the public internet or you're not going to be able to meet them, right? So let's shift a little bit and talk about the cost side of things. So I've always found it interesting that there's a lot of corollaries between the physical sciences and the stuff we do in computers computer software. And I'm not the first one to point this out, but there's a strong analogy between Newton's laws of motions and what we do in software. So Newton's first law is that objects tend to stay at rest until an outside force is applied. Have you ever noticed that applications tend to run just great until we start changing them? Same idea. As we change things, we apply force, uh, we introduce errors. Second law, is that the momentum change is proportional to the amount of force applied. Well, the more we change things, the more we break it, the more likely it is we're gonna break something, right? That's why a lot of systems go into freeze right now in, uh, in the holiday system in the United States. They just don't touch the systems in many cases because uh, they know they'll stay up and working for the busy holiday season. So if you accept that premise, you have to come to the conclusion that velocity, how fast you're able to move and change things, is inversely proportional to availability. And if you try to chase high availability, the single biggest cost you're gonna pay is your ability to move fast is going to be compromised. You will lose velocity. So uh, we saw a little bit about Facebook's and, and their concept of SRE. I'm gonna talk a little bit about one aspect of SRE uh, called the error budget. And it's about explicitly managing this relationship of velocity and availability. A couple of references for you. The first one is the one that kind of defines things, published by some Google engineers. Uh, there's a couple of others that are pretty good. Really interesting idea about how Google approaches doing their operations using uh, site reliability engineering concepts. We're only going to talk about one premise. You could spend an entire day just on SRE concepts. 
uh, but this idea of pursuing maximum change velocity without violating an SLO. A couple of definitions, if you're not familiar with them, we've all heard SLA. Uh, they define things slightly differently. Uh, an SLI is a service level indicator. This is basically any sort of metric, and an error rate would be an example. Then you set up an SLO on top of that SLI. So basically a max error rate of 0.1%. So in this case, that'd be three nines worth of success. Then you set up the service level agreement by a set of SLOs. So what is an error budget? What you do is you translate your SLO into an acceptable number of errors. So in this case, we had 0.1% uh, or three nines, and the system averages a million requests a month, for example. You do the math, you can say, okay, we're okay for 1,000 requests a month to serve an error and still meet our SLO. If you only had, if you did five nines, you'd only have 10. So you start to see some of the difference in what you can play with here. What do you do with this? You spend this asset just like you would any organizational financial budget. You spend it though, but instead of on hardware, you're spending it on maximizing your velocity. So what, what does this mean? How do you do this? So when you start off, uh, let's say you're under budget. You don't have zero or one errors. What you do is you put the gas pedal down and you go as fast as you can. You work on more features at the same time, maybe a little less QA than normal, larger canaries are deploying faster. You simply move faster. If you do that, you're gonna start triggering errors, right? As you go through and start causing errors, you start to pull back a little bit on the throttle. Less features, more QA, smaller canaries. You just start to move slower. And if you, don't, you should slow down the number of errors if you do that, but if for some reason you don't and you continue to consume your budget, eventually when you get to the end, if you run out of budget, you stop deployments. This is where this gets tested a bit in organizations because people start, what, we're stopping in deployment? It's very important we get this out. But if you're committed to your SLO, that's what you do. But you don't stop work, you don't go to the ping pong table or uh, what do you do with that time? You spend more time on analyzing where the budget went and why. And what could we do to be more efficient on that next time around? So here's an example of an error budget. Uh, we start off, things are going along, we trickle through a few problems here and there, but then we see this big drop, about half of our budget in one day do the analysis and somebody did deployment with no canary, pushed out something with a small problem. Before they could roll it back, we'd issued a lot of errors. So we change, be a little more careful. Canaries very slowly, but eventually we do run out because of this big drop. You hit zero, you stop your deployments, at least for a few days until you hit the, the SLO again. So what are the benefits of doing this? I think the biggest one is it removes the fear of errors. We all think that, oh, any single error is bad. No, they're not. They're a sign of velocity. They're showing you're changing and moving things along. And it also builds confidence that you're going to meet the SLO. Because you can see, it's like, oh, even when we did a small mistake, we only consumed 10% of our budget. We are definitely okay. And most importantly is you get data-driven engineering choices to make here. Should we deploy this now or wait till next week? Can we deploy these two features at the same time? Yeah, yeah, we, we have the budget to do it. So what if you're even at the end of the month or your 30 day period, you're still, you're doing such a good job, you're consistently have an extra budget, it, it means you're over delivering on your SLO. Good thing, right? Consider introducing errors if that's the case. Why? What would we cons put errors into the system on purpose? Why would we do that? Well, it keeps dependent services from assuming a higher SLO 
than you're actually delivering based upon your history. Why? Okay. A couple of examples of this. Uh, it's in the SRE book, but Google Chubby is a distributed lock system that Google puts out. People had built dependencies on it, and whenever they took it down for maintenance, people were screaming. It's like, no, we still met our SLO, but people were unhappy. S3 had the same kind of problem about a year and a half ago. S3 in the uh, US East region went down for a little while because of an admin error. And even the status page to show S3 was dependent on S3. So it showed uh, green all the way through because it had never been pushed beyond that SLO. So everything I've talked about to up till now, well documented, well practiced in many organizations. Here's a bit of a frontier alert. We're crossing over into some things that are, instead of like uh, cutting edge, we're going to bleeding edge now. So we spend most of our time at Autoscaler on this left side of the wall. That's one reason I'm kind of uh, aware of it. We focus on cost optimizations, trying to drive operational costs down of these systems. And um, everything on, on, on the left, essentially. And when you're doing that, there's really two things that you're working with. A cost availability curve and also a cost performance curve. Somewhere along that line, you pin it down what's important for the business and it drives cost. Sometimes you can lower costs by dropping it just a little bit. Same thing is true on the performance side of things. A lot of times you can save considerably by pushing that envelope just a little bit. And I'm here to, yeah, sure it works that time. I'm gonna make a claim here that the majority of cloud applications are actually over provisioned. And I'll go through and explain why I think that. Definitely not getting five nines out of my clicker. <laughs> so over provisioning drivers. Um, who sets the scaling parameters on a cloud system, right? That DevOps guy, one of us here in this room. If you're under provisioned, it's felt, right? Things are gonna run slow, uh, you're, gonna get, you're gonna get text, you're gonna get alarms, after hours stuff, you're gonna feel pain, right? What if you're over provisioned? No symptoms other than cost. Where are you gonna put the auto scaling parameters, right? Yeah, you put them till you feel no pain and you don't realize that maybe you've gone a little too far. Who pays the bill? Not that guy, another guy. Starting to see this different perspective just like we had with dev and ops. Different perspectives lead to different decisions. So a lot of what we're about is trying to and close the communication gap between those. So fear-driven versus data-driven. We talked about fear of downtime drove the availability requirements. Fear of performance problems drives over-specified performance. So some questions for you to kind of see if you fall in this group. Do you have a performance SLO for your application? Is it data-driven or is it be fast? Is it a one second response time? That's a good clue that it's not data driven. Somebody just said, hey, make it one second or faster. Uh, all requests faster than X seconds or 95th percentile. These are clues about how you're doing. So here's an example of an SLO and response time. Response time in blue or SLO in green. Looks great, right? I'm here to tell you that's over provisioning. We never even bumped up against it we could probably do the same SLO for less money. So how can we make this data driven? So we implemented error budgets at Autoscaler for our own operations and derived a lot of benefit from them. And in the process of doing that, we started to think, hey, could we use this same idea to apply towards this problem? Could we make a quantitative trade-off? So we went and tried this. Create a performance budget from an SLO and then we're gonna spend that budget on lowering operational cost. Instead of a trade-off with velocity, we're trading it off with operational cost. So same idea, 
Whenever we're under budget, we run more cost effective, less spare capacity closer to the edge. As we start to bump up against the wall, we add some spare capacity. And if we don't catch it quick enough and we get close to our SLO, we over provision. We go to more capacity. But this gives us a balance. So we actually have driving forces both ways. So what does this look like? So as we're coming along, performance is pretty good all the way up till there. It goes slightly over. So we spent just a little bit of our performance budget. Happened right during a scale up, as you'd expect. Again, a little bit later, it happens one more time. Okay, so we're slowly spinning it, but now you see how it's balanced. We're kind of close to the SLO most of the time. So forget about that. That's, that's like how to calculate the performance budget. So now, if this is your performance budget, what do you do with it? How do you respond to it? So the idea here is if you're in this top half, you reduce your spare capacity when you're up here. That means you're, you, this is a signal that you're over provisioned. So you try to bring it down a little bit. And if you're below the line, that means you're a little, you need more spare capacity, right? You're a little under provisioned. So by doing this, you can kind of control your system. So here's another example that goes into more detail. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on here, so I'll use the pointer. This is spare capacity settings on the right, started off at about 35%. And our SLO here is that 99.5% of the time, we're within 10% of the capacity. And in this case, it's a Kubernetes cluster. What's interesting is we applied these techniques, and over time, it's, it started to say, okay, we can lower the spare capacity based upon the system scaling up and down. And you can see it got all the way down to about 20%. And then it's decided that the CPU actually needs more CPU than memory, so it kept it a little bit higher. And we started spending the performance budget, but it's leveled out. Okay, So it, it helps you find that point about where the balance is between the two. And this can save considerable amount of money. There's 15 to 20% of capacity that we had extra that we don't need. So the results of this, by adjusting the spare capacity uh, to meet the SLO, we reduced over-provisioning significantly. Here's the best part about it, it's automatic. No supervision required. You don't have to go in and tweak and tune, check it every other day. And it adjusts to your changing load over time. So if your application gets more spiky, it'll automatically detect that and start to add more spare capacity. So um, I have a paper presented to SREcon for this topic. Uh, so I'm looking to get that in its next year. I think it's in April in uh, New York. But I am looking for potential uh, cases to go through. So if this kind of thing of balancing performance budgets and automatically changing spare capacity is interesting to you or your organization, definitely get in touch with me because I'm looking for use cases to kind of show its effectivity. So just to wrap up, application quality, higher availability is better, fewer errors is better, fewer slow responses is better. Hopefully we've busted that as a myth. They are important, but you have to trade them off with your velocity and your operational cost and using error budgets and performance budgets are a way to do that with an engineering trade-off. That's my contact info. Anybody who's interested in talking about these concepts or drones, <laughs> come by and talk to me. And uh, even if you don't speak English well, my wife can translate, so don't be afraid. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any